basically, what it is. What does it mean? How many of how many of you here actually feels that you could be a software craftsman? At least one, two, three, four. Good, because that's kind of a level of term is uh, elusive. You can't become a craftsman. It's something that's given from the outside. It's your peers that actually decide, hey, that guy is so good that I want to he, he, he to be my mentor or something like that. Why do we do this? Why do we want to be a craftsman? Well, basically, because it's good for you. When you are good, you can do things that you like. You become better in the things that you like. What this basically means is that it's really natural. You can code and do absolutely amazing things with your code by being good and trying to learn all the time. Also, being so good at what you do and becoming better all the time, it gives a certain amount of predictability. When you work for someone and they know you're really good, they know what to expect. If they have absolutely no idea what is your level, skill level, it's going to be random. What comes out, it might be good, it might be bad, but it can't be predicted. When you are kind of when your peers think, oh, that guy is so good, I want to work with him, you can be pretty sure that also your manager knows what to expect. So it kind of has, it sets the standard for your work. Which brings us to ethics. Well, you can't live without ethics. These are of utmost importance. This is the backbone that all your work builds on. If you don't have ethics, I don't pretty much care what you do because you're kind of um, like a leaf in a wind. You change directions so fast that I can't fall. And by ethics, I bet you mean these things. Do no harm. Basically, don't write shitty software. We don't want to harm people. Um, some people could explain these ethics like, uh, I'm a peaceful guy, I don't want to write talking programs for long-range missiles. Anyway, that our needs define in our actions, so we must be pretty adamant and uphold our ethics all the time. Also, by focusing on ethics, in the long run, with our credibility, we will produce more value. And then the third, the no with the exclamation mark. That basically means that it's actually required from a craftsman to say no under certain circumstances. How many of you have had uh, requirements from your boss or a life manager that you immediately know I can't do it, that's impossible. Not with this time frame, not with this technology, not with something that uh, has an important factor in your context. In those situations, you must say, no, this can't be done. I don't mean that you have to be hostile like of yours, not going to do it, but hey, no, no, sorry, can I interrupt? We can't do this because, and then you give all the reasons for in your context, why you can't do that. Other thing is honesty. Basically, don't lie. Lying sucks. Don't lie first in your estimates. Don't lie in your skills. If you are asking that, do you know Cobble? Don't say yes. Just get to talk, for example. This is pretty important thing is lying you see. It can be all those small little white lies that when they actually add up, you end up in a situation that uh, you have bloated yourself into an unknown being. 
people really don't know what you are. And then they kind of predict what you can produce and bring to the table. I mentioned the estimations. We had a pretty interesting discussion at lunch regarding estimations. Um, also, there's Tom that had an excellent presentation about metrics and his no metrics stuff. And he kind of uh, touched those no estimates. How many of you have heard about no estimates hashtag or the movement around no estimating? One, two. Well, you must be able to estimate. That's unavoidable. If you can avoid it, it's all good. But it's really dependent on the context. You have a deadline. This marketing campaign is starting on 20th of December. We need to have the software by that. In that case, you really need to estimate whether you can do it or not. Or if you can do, let's say, five of the features, and at least three must be left out for the next release. Uh, you all know software, you know estimates. Most likely they come from, well, estimates are random guesses. It's estimating. Okay, it may be aided by your professionalism and your history and knowledge. You can give educated guesses, but it's still guessing. Sometimes necessary, not always bad. Very, very context dependent, as one of my dear friends would say. It depends on context. Okay, let's just skip that slide. And passion, I already mentioned passion. Uh, how many of you feel passionate about COVID? Good, because that's the fuel that I run on. Well, I, I like to have when I speak. Uh, basically, I quote. Someone might even call me a beat. But basically, passion is what drives humans to uh, extraordinary achievements. So that's kind of when you have to find your passion, whether it be management, budgeting, finances, whatnot. But there has to be the passion behind all the actions that we do. Within the passion, we have to build a community. There's already an awesome initiative, start by team, before the keynote, about we, how we can just consume the community. We have to give back. That's especially important within programming, programmers, developers, around the world, because we actually, we build on the shoulder of giants, on, on the shoulder of people who have done stuff before us. But let's say they built MongoDB, enabling awesome stuff. Could we have done that without a community? No. It's basically, we need a community. We have to share what we do, how we do it, and we have to mentor other people. One interesting the thing about software craftsmanship is that almost everyone that I admire, they have one trait, one thing that they share in common. It's that they are very friendly, open, and always willing to share their knowledge. Because I work in a small consultancy, we have like 40, 40 plus enterprise channel developers. And there are like three absolutely brilliant guys. The best thing about those guys is not, uh, not their knowledge, but the way that they are all the time, I don't know if, if, if it's kind of without their consent, but they are sharing their knowledge. They are mentoring others, uh, less than mortals. Because these guys are good, they are really good. So that's kind of how it comes natural. When you know enough, you kind of how much rather you start to help out people. You push them forward, or you pull them with you. Also, this passion thing is that um, every day we put our reputation on stake. There are business people around who expect stuff. If we let them down once, twice, thrice, how do you think they will feel? Can they trust us anymore? 
we promise one thing and we deliver another one? I don't think so. So we basically have to deliver what we promise. When we are predictable, it's easy. And when we don't lie about ourselves or our abilities, it's pretty easy to gain that trust. Also, it's pretty easy to lose it. That's why you sometimes should have to say no. No is basically a word that means let's initiate a discussion. This won't work, so we have to find another way around it. That's very important and that's very useful, very joyful. Uh, has anyone of you uh, experienced been, uh, a situation where you can't say no to a manager? Being more 
accurate or a little bit more careful, I could have avoided it. But it's no big deal. Everyone makes mistakes. And also, one thing that, about humility is that we have to acknowledge the people who were here before us, who have created the foundations that we build upon. So basically those who actually did the hard mathematics on during the Second World War and cracked some secret languages from, from Germany and Germans and so forth. They are there and they are building on their shoulders. I'm like little kids. When I see a new library somewhere, a gadget or something, I drop my clothes and I kind of stop my work. I immediately have to know what's going on. Curiosity is the kind of um, it's the fuel for the fuel of fuel for our passion, or it's a one very important part of it. Curiosity it makes it, it makes it impossible for me to kind of uh, stop into a small context. My curiosity opens doors for me. So basically, with my curiosity, I dig out new things, I found out new things, I learned a lot. And after this kind of a short stint of curiosity, browsing the web, walking through the documentation of a new library or API or whatnot, I'm a bit bigger. Not physically, but inside. I learned a thing or two. The curiosity is something that keeps us from locking ourselves down to something like COBOL. I apparently work with people who actually program COBOL. They have been programming the same program for the last 30 years. What's that? I don't know. Interesting people, I have to say. Yeah, well, it's still like this stuff. You, you just can't avoid many friends and stuff like that. Things just happen. But with our curiosity, we can actually expand our own comfort zone. So we're not kind of, uh, we don't feel that we're out of place if someone just goes, hey, you, come, we have a new JavaScript project, and now you're a front end developer. And you're okay with it. Because with your own curiosity, outside the work time, you have actually Take a step to learn a thing too when you're not trying. That's one thing also that actually is a pretty good definition for a craftsman with the software development context. How many of you who code actually code at home? Because the work context that we usually are in, they have their own constraints, there are restrictions on what you can do. You can't just take the latest reactive JavaScript library and put it into a full enterprise JavaScript ED environment. It just doesn't work like that. But when you're at home, you're at liberty to do whatever you want. And your curiosity is to feel for that. And that's the good part of the software crash. Clean code. Who knows what this is? Cool. Some of you do. After this, I hope quite many of you do too. So basically, clean code means all of this and much more. Um, how many of you have heard of the voice control? Leave the camp cleaner than it, than it was when you came to the campsite. Good. So basically, whenever you touch a piece of code, Make sure that when you leave, it's in a cleaner shape than when you came in. It includes refactoring, don't repeat yourself, and involves solid principles, single responsibility, open flows, list of substitution principle, inversion of depression, the internet's full of stuff. I suggest that you go and browse through clean code. There are at least one excellent book about it from Robert C. Martin on the wall. He's a fanatic on this subject. I can recommend his books, definitely, if you want to write good, maintainable code.
good that you are not embarrassed to look at after two weeks. That's actually a pretty good test. That if you take the code that you wrote, let's say a month ago, you take a good look at it. Does it look good or ugly? My code user looks, looks ugly and then I have to go twiddle it and make it look a little bit better. Remove the dependency, isolate the kind of functionality over there, improve the testability, and so on. But then we come to the point, I posit that the software crash machine is not enough. It takes you to a certain point. Apart from that, it's not enough. It's still a box. And usually a box has its borders. And what we need to do is to step outside of the box. Use the slide. We step out of the comfort, comfortable box of software crash machine. We are good at what we do. We are getting better all the time. We have a vibrant community. We help other people to become better. And in the process, we become better ourselves. The reason is that you can be so more time. You can be so much more. The usual Atlas of lots of talk about cross functional things, you know, they're database engineers, they are uh, testers, you name it. But what is actually required before we can have a really good cross functional team? You can have these people that are siloed. I know all the testing, I know all the Java, I know all the Unix process. We should first have a cross-functional individual. And you become one by the curious and passionate about what you do. Because the code itself is only a small piece of what we do. Sorry about the amount of text. I try to keep my slides very short. This is, well, you can read. Still, even if we are excellent at what we do, we produce clean code, we have our passion ethics, we are predictable and we are trustworthy, we are still part of the system. Within the system, we are constraints and we have to know them. We have to understand the context we are working in. Basically, what it means is that. You have to know why we are making the software that we are making. If we are just blindly executing, even though it would be awesome code and it would be made with passion, if we don't know why, it's really pointless. You really need to know, go out there and know the business. I mean, basically, how would you architect? And a software or a piece of software, however complex or simple, if you don't know the business. This is basically covering Avi's last presentation. Why are we doing this? If we just take a bunch of specifications and we go and implement that, most likely it's a piece of crap. We have to know the business and the reasons why we're doing what we're doing. And you can't really figure it out if you're just staring at the monitor on the screen. We have to learn the business. But at least the reasons why we are in the business makes the branding software so much easier. And then people. I know most of really hardcore developers, they are not so outgoing and extrovert as I am. Still, I say that at least 50% of software development is basically handling social relationships. It's discussion, it's communication. Because that's how we gather the information. You can't lock yourself into a room and wait for someone drops into the mailbox and requirement that they can go and execute a little bit of code. It doesn't just work that way. Because 
there are people involved. We're human beings, we need each other. There has to be some kind of a connection between those people who do software, those who need it, and those who will use it. Those very short feedback loops about introducing the end users in the first place, even before we do the development. That's kind of, yes, absolutely. You need to involve the people, and it actually requires human that's that's uh, sometimes difficult. Kind of. People are sometimes difficult. But we really, we really, even developers, we have to learn how to navigate within the organization. There are people who will object and they will think that our thinking sucks or our ideas suck or that you made the wrong decision. So, as we can know. It's just a starting point for the communication. We have to put the cap on the table, so what's that real issue? And maybe the most important thing that you have to always remember that you are not alone. You're always working with someone or for someone or for some cause that is important to someone. There are always people involved. So I'm taking a short introduction to drama by acting. It can't hurt you. I would say that it would benefit all of you to become better in expressing yourself, your ideas, and the feelings that you have. Because I don't know how many of you have thinking, have been thought about them. feelings. Like your colleague comes to work as kind of a really depressed and stuff like that. But still you have to deliver. But when the team is kind of handicapped, for well, some reason that someone has, okay, maybe they have not cheated or he has a problem with her girlfriend or something like that. It has an explicit effect on the people. So we might be able also to handle this kind of a part of some awkward human situations to get the best out of the people, in, even in their harder circumstances. Isn't your agile? Isn't your agile? There is no such thing as a 
agile in general is a it's an, an umbrella term. We can put a whole lot of stuff under the term agile, even bad stuff. So it's kind of a, I don't like to associate it with agility. I want to no, I don't know if I can work for it, but it's kind of a focus very conscious thinking all the time, adapting and learning in your context what works and what doesn't. Very crucial thing in that is the feedback loop. Make it short so that you can adjust in time.
they are usually much bigger problems in the system than people. So yeah, you might have a couple of guys who are not so good at programming. Well, yeah, go and read them. I, I guess that's not the problem we are looking at. If you have uh, a cycle time of two years from idea to production, I'd say that's a problem. Then it doesn't really matter if you have one, ten, one hundred, one thousand excellent software craftsmen working for a product. Because the whole system just doesn't work. If you optimize yourself and you keep it local, you are just going to create queues. Queue. Queue. How do you pronounce that? Well, you will create work for others to consume in a faster pace than they can actually consume. And that's going to be your inventory, and that's not good. It blocks work, it makes everything slower. And in the end, it still takes two years to deliver from idea to production. No matter how fast your development cycle is. Because the other, other parts of the system are not optimized. So, if you want to be a, or if you want to go beyond software craftsmanship, you have to start thinking about the system, the context you're working in. You have to break outside the box, look outside the code and the system you're building on, and try to make the, the whole thing better. I don't know if I can say any better than that. That's basically it. Thank you. It, uh, this is my pretty handle. All feedback is welcome. And now, one minor thing. I would like at least one person here to object to something. 